The rustic court at Sheha was awash with the patter of rain on the yellowed tiles. In the main bedchamber, Liu Bei sat on a mat looking over at Zhuge Liang, who was rolling some paper out across the floor. Taking ink, brush and weights from the table under the window, he sat. Who else could have the Emperor's ear so enthralled but he in that moment? Who else wielded the mandate of heaven with such craft? Zhuge Liang took a long breath and began the lesson taught to him by the long, empty skies of Sleeping Dragon Ridge. Your Majesty, there is not a single thing that has happened which was not vital to the salvation of the Empire and the establishment of the Five Powers. You are at the center of this, and your despair only shows that the final gateway must now be traversed. Allow me to lay it out for you, Your Majesty, and the journey you have undertaken will seem clear. Liu Bei sat up and looked his mentor in the eyes. Zhuge Liang had his usual wry smile, but it faded as he began reciting. Although you are of noble lineage, your father left you nothing. However, in your spirit, you knew your destiny. By not abandoning your Liu name and asserting your rights as a scion of the royal house, you went from a mat weaver to a prestigious general and sought after advisor. In this way, you mastered the concept of nobility. And yet devious men plagued the empire and refused to let peace settle. They forced you to fight, and in doing so, brought upon themselves great humiliation. For your selection of men and officers was exquisite, and your bravery employing them in war unrivaled. In battle after battle, you showed that you could not be conquered. In this way, you mastered the concept of a warrior. In victory you gained much, but your enemies redoubled their efforts at every turn, and each step towards salvation seemed to worsen the Empire's woes also. But despite the upheaval, you found the time to visit stubborn pedants in mountaintop retreats and humble yourself before their learning. In this way, you mastered the concept of scholarship. Then, when the great peril against the Han finally faded, you knew what had to be done to stabilize the dynasty. You took pity upon Emperor Xian and allowed him to rest while you shouldered his burden. At last, the final connection with the usurper Dong was severed, and the realm was set at ease. Great sicknesses were cured, and restless nights banished, as all those in your care praised a bold and righteous son of heaven at last. Amid the Empire's joy, you mastered the hearts of the people. Finally, with the four worldly masteries in your possession, the Empire was restored. But to make permanent this achievement, the otherworldly mastery, the fifth, must be sought. This is the true meaning behind Zheng Jiang's disposition. You, your majesty, must become the Tao, the uniting force between all things. Understand all this, and Queen Zheng will join you as naturally as a flower sprouts from a stem. Ignore all this, and be only contented that at least the new great cycle of death is not here at this moment. Liu Bei was no scholar and had only the faintest grasp of his tutor's meaning. He asked, Master, how do I become the Tao? How can I make the Empire eternal? There is a simple method, of great difficulty to employ. It is known as inviting five into the hall with four seats. It is a strange practice, familiar to the likes of Queen Zheng, familiar too to Gong Du and Huang Shao, I dare say. However, this method is so unusual that I dare not present it to you, your majesty. Please, master, your wisdom has already saved the empire, and your strategies fell rebels like reeds. How can I go on knowing that I'm too ignorant to protect the Han? Your majesty, I did not say this method would protect the Han, but only the empire. Liu Bei begged Zhuge Liang to go on, and finally he did. Every time the Empire falls, it is because it takes but a moat of corruption to stall the entire enterprise. The crisis of our age was caused by but ten eunuchs and an Emperor without the will to employ his powers. This simple mistake, common among the ten thousand villages, killed untold millions like a tiger in the streets. What if there had been one hundred eunuchs? How many of them would have possessed that rare virtue that renders them suitable for high office? Perhaps one? Perhaps eunuchs are not suitable at all. 
Shall we add 100 nobles, 100 warriors, 100 scholars, 100 commoners? Will any possess great virtue? What if it were a thousand? Ten thousand? Why take a chance? Could we not imagine all people? If there is none great enough to lead among all people, then that failure rests on heaven and we need not exert ourselves further. But if there is even one great enough to lead, what effort is not too great to seek this person out? It would be impossible, with only ten scouts, a lifelong endeavour with one thousand, a costly campaign with ten thousand, but if all were to search out the good and pass over the bad, finding worthy officials would be as easy as turning over your hand. This is the secret to inviting five into the hall with four seats. When you must choose one of the five to leave, the number of voices must be beyond bribery, beyond chance evils, and encompassing all four of the worldly classes. Therefore, the mandate of heaven, which is wont to flicker between families like a butterfly across a meadow, can be known. And in time, one will focus their eyes and see that the butterfly is one of a swarm, dancing back and forth endlessly, visible to those who have embraced the Tao, and comprehensible not to any one man, but only to mankind's unified will. The world can be set to order forever if this can be achieved. You must ensure that across the realm, no one has power they have not earned, and no one has power that can be better wielded by those below them. The first man to follow these rules must be you. That is why I say the Han will not be saved. But the world you, the last scion of the Han protected, will last forever. Upon hearing these final words, Liu Bei finally collapsed to the ground, unconscious. He dreamt of that great field of flowers and saw above it a huge jade butterfly. From the four corners of the sky came dragons who set upon the butterfly like wolves upon a deer. Then the butterfly burst open and an uncountable number of smaller butterflies of all colours were cast out in all directions. The dragons, swooping around, were unable to catch them and returned to their distant palaces beyond the sky. The butterflies settled among the field and fluttered this way and that without warning. When Liu Bei woke up, the rain had ceased and the cold mountain winds were battering lit candles all around. And so when freed, the people fear the dragons no more, Zhuge Liang sung, concluding a ballad written out on a stretch of silk he was inspecting. He did not speak aloud the poet's signature, which read, Huang Shao, wielder of the heavenly way. The first light of dawn was visible when Liu Bei finally summoned the strength to rise. Zhuge Liang handed him some pages, military dispatches. Younger brother has done it. The kingdom of Yan is no more, Liu Bei said. So then, this empire is yours. Whatever you wish to do with it, I shall await your command, the Prime Minister said, finally taking his leave. Liu Bei could not enjoy the silence left in his wake for the noise of the strange wisdom previously imparted was inescapable. Servants brought him breakfast, but he dismissed them without a glance. The food was untouched when they returned at midday. By then, Liu Bei had come to a decision. We must seek out Queen Zhang and make her people our own, he announced to the court. Only then will the way forward be clear. No one but the Prime Minister knew what this meant, but the order was straightforward. His army linked up with Shahudun's marching column arriving from the south and entered the bandit queen's mountain commandery of Taiyuan. Meanwhile, Zhang Fei led efforts to pacify Gong Sun Zan's remaining fiefs in the northeast, and Pang Tong and Zhao Yun were sent far out into Xiliang to defeat rogue governor Han Sui. In these campaigns, the might of the imperial armies was far beyond resisting. But making a show of doing so regardless was the last act of defiance the ostracized nobles could muster. Therefore, the civil war was in fact to continue, quietening more and more for another year. Liu Bei captured Taiyuan, killing many of Zheng Zhang's belligerent subordinates in the process. The queen herself remained elusive, and her remaining followers were too loyal to disclose anything. Thus, Liu Bei was frustrated and his understanding of Zhuge Liang's scheme remained murky. In the summer of the year 199, 
the final blows of the war were struck. In the distant reaches of the empire, beside the banks of the river that marked the entrance to the strange world of the west, Shahudun slaughtered the last band of Han Sui's stubborn retinue. After the work was carried out, he rode over to Jian Yong and said, Take care of my horse, will you? She's earned a rest. Where are you going, General? Jian Yong asked. Shahudun shook his head. People will say we have achieved much. I will not. Lord Jian, I will never think of what we did for this empire again. You may write what you wish of it, and of me. Farewell. With this, he handed over the reins to his horse, dismounted, and walked away. General Shahu, what of the Emperor's orders? Jian Yong called. If they reach me before I cross that river, I will obey, Shahudun replied, not turning around. He threw down several pieces of his armor, then hurled his spear high into the air. It soared over a hundred meters, then thudded down onto the opposite bank of the river. Without delay, he entered the water and swam through it as if the current was not rushing along, cutting a straight path to the opposite bank. There he grabbed his spear, dragged himself onto the bank, and trudged onward into the vast deserts beyond. Somewhere over the horizon, a single road snaked off to lands unknowably distant and foreign. Such was the will of that Tiger General of the Han. On the opposite side of the empire, in the imperial capital of Donghai, Liu Bei sat down on his throne, and 1,000 officials bowed throughout the grand hall of his palace. Among them were Sun Tzu, Yuan Tan, Xi Xie, Ma Tong, Chen Chao, Yi Jian Li Ting, Tong Yu Rei, Kong Rong, Gao Ding, Liu Yan, Liu Yao, and Liu Biao. Between them all, the realm bowed to their single monarch. Missing was Zheng Jiang. Liu Bei thought back to the instruction Zhuge Liang had given him a year prior, and decided, In the wake of our great achievement, the people have been disturbed. Food rots while peasants starve. How can we claim victory in this state? I have an idea to solve this matter. Why not instruct the county officials to handle it? Who has time to petition the emperor for aid if their village goes hungry? Let them request food from the county offices. Should any official ignore such a request out of malice, then five candidate replacements will be found, and any who care to do so can submit cases for and against each one to the commandery. With this practice, a virtuous man can be reckoned according to the Tao, and hunger will be like fog lifted to heaven by the sun. Who will say the empire is a menace then? This instruction was called seditious and unfilial, but it was the emperor's will. It seemed to violate the old principles of governorship, and yet it began to blossom. After the year's harvest, surplus food was bought up and ferried about by the county constables, bringing joy to those with ruined fields and homes. The surplus, upon investigation, far exceeded the empire's needs. Only such a deadly oversight could have brought an empire as powerful as the Han to the brink of destruction. Winter approached, but all had their stores in order, and the farms were already being expanded by those eager to profit more from this market. Additionally, the later details of the edict saw many officials rise and fall. In Kuai Ji, a man named Cao Cao was chosen as magistrate after appeals from nobles, warriors, scholars and the people alike. With others ready to take his place, how could he be complacent? The county's roads were paved so that his caravans might impress the people with their speed, and the nobles were allowed to accompany their produce so that their productivity could garner them prestige. In this way, and way similar, the empire came to be truly at peace and surpassed that which had come before. With Zhuge Liang nodding along beside him, Liu Bei allowed several other officers to both act as they saw fit in many matters but be subject to the popular test of competence. This caused the number of matters directly concerning the emperor and his high officials to decrease, which brought those high officials a feeling of uneasiness. Perhaps that too could be attended to, but Liu Bei's taste for politics did not last long beyond that winter of 199. He was ever searching for information on Zheng Jiang, who had still not resurfaced. 
Have I not embodied the Tao? Liu Bei complained to Zhuge Liang. If you have to ask, then you have not. Such is the nature of the Tao, he replied. Guan Yu and Zhang Fei, overhearing this conversation from nearby, were bitter to hear this religious talk carrying on. That bookworm might as well be the emperor, Zhang Fei said. Or there might as well be no emperor at all, the way he insists everyone else handles matters, Guan Yu said. He's up to no good. Elder brother seems to be under his spell, so we'll have to watch him closely. And be rid of him quickly, Zhang Fei added. Long, idle days carried on, with the two brothers staying as close to Liu Bei as they could. But Zhuge Liang had already planted all the seeds required, for Liu Bei continued adjusting the county, commandery and provincial administrations according to the Tao. It was decreed that any man able to solicit a bribe from a government post could rightfully claim that post themselves. This overturned the method of doing things from the smallest village to the highest halls. The sea of officials belonging to the imperial court was tempestuous over the following year, with people being appointed only to be removed at once in some cases. While appeals to intervene arrived at the imperial court constantly, Liu Bei waved them away with the retort, How can heaven be concerned with this? Discontent among the highest government ranks grew, however Zhuge Liang's scheme was too far along to overcome. Indeed, now that so many posts were constantly harried by rival incumbents, the people, the soldiers, lacked unified loyalty to the current occupant. The crux of the Prime Minister's genius was to turn people's affection from their patrons within the government to the system of government itself. Thus, the realm endured and grew out of its sickness at an astounding rate. Like an island rising from the depths of the ocean, the Han Empire, or perhaps simply the Chinese Empire, became ever more complex and ever more indomitable. Innovations in agriculture, sailing, writing and music began to fill the pages of the official records, and while many would scoff at it all, they were like herdsmen refusing to step back from a growing fire. By the end of summer in the year 203, Zhuge Liang's reforms were in place, but for a single detail. The office of emperor still had its mandate untested. Since the highest office could not be appointed by its natural superior, Zhuge Liang devised another approach. He wrote a treatise in which he imagined the emperor's heir be chosen by ballot of all the existing officials. The choices would be set out by the previous emperor and were to be five in number. The least popular choice would be removed in successive ballots until one remained. In this way, the empire would choose its emperor. The mandate of heaven would become the mandate of earth. This radical scheme violated the heavenly supremacy enjoyed by the sign of heaven, so even Zhuge Liang dared not present it to the emperor without extraordinary flair. For that purpose, he wrote to his cousin Zhuge Xuan in Badong. The message was carried up a long mountain road to a simple wooden temple. There, Zhuge Xuan sighed upon reading the letter. That little cousin of mine sees everything. I shall have to marry again, no doubt. Well, if this will bring us peace, I shouldn't delay, he thought. He went into the small hut behind the temple complex and handed the letter over to its single resident. A month later, Zhuge Liang invited Liu Bei to his home in the capital for a feast. Curiously, he asked that Guan Yu and Zhang Fei not attend. What's the meaning of this? Zhang Fei snarled. He snubs us so openly now. Elder brother, how can you let him do this? Calm brother, I expect he means to lecture me and does not wish to bore you with such talk, Liu Bei said. I've no particular aversion to it. Allow me to go at least, so that nothing foul can occur, Guan Yu said. Foul? Brother, how can you know Master Sleeping Dragon so poorly after all this time? How can I bring an uninvited guest and give baseless suspicion as my reason? If I were visiting a distant acquaintance, I would be mocked by all for such behaviour. But visiting a close friend and hero of the realm? This is unthinkable! How dare you suggest such a thing? Liu Bei dismissed his brothers, and indeed attended the feast with only his personal servants, who waited patiently outside Zhuge Liang's compound. Still, 
Guan Yu and Zhang Fei were not at all happy and made their own plans. That evening, Zhuge Liang and Liu Bei were sitting together in a back room, when Zhuge Liang produced a small book. Your Majesty, this is the last of my wisdom, he said, handing it over. The first page read, The Expression of Heaven's Mandate, The Will of Earthly Life. Such a volume, I cannot wait to read it, Liu Bei said. You should read it at once, I am eager to discuss it with you. But, Prime Minister, forgive me, but you summoned me here saying you had news of Zheng Jiang. How can I commit my mind to this when you leave me awaiting this word? This book is the route through the final gateway to heaven. Complete its study, and Zheng Jiang's Tao will be satisfied. In fact, you'll find that on closer inspection, her precise location is revealed in those very pages. At this, Liu Bei set to quickly reading the tome. Inside, Zhuge Liang's plan for a contest of five heirs was detailed, with all manner of stipulations on the best course of action to take upon various disruptions and eventualities. Once he was done reading, Liu Bei was frustrated. This fantasy! You cannot be advising me to violate the will of heaven! And what clue is this meant to be? He said. Your Majesty, I feared you would react this way and did not want to reveal this work to you. Please forgive me, I never should have divined this offensive wisdom. The expression of heaven's mandate. Are you trying to say this is heaven's will? Heaven would have you be the founder of the everlasting empire. That is your role. The first man who encompassed all things like heaven itself. As your tireless servant, it fell to me to present this to you. Seeing as you are the son of heaven, however, your understanding of these matters must be great. If it seems mistaken to you, how can I ever argue otherwise? Master Sleeping Dragon, I have spoken out of turn. Allow me to think on this further. Of course. I have a certain Xiliang wine here that is said to bring great clarity to one's mind. Even though it is exceedingly rare, I would gladly offer it to you, Your Majesty. Liu Bei accepted and Zhuge Liang poured out two cups from a lavishly decorated bowl. Liu Bei remained buried in the book, reading it all the way through again without even touching the wine. Zhuge Liang, simply watching, left his own wine also. Both cups were nearly cold when Liu Bei finally said, This final page, it seems like something's missing. It says, The one who brings together the realm is the only being the Tao greets by name. That name. Then it ends. What name is this? Your Majesty, your humble nature holds you back at this final moment, but that is only proof of your worth. That name is yours, Your Majesty. Zhuge Liang pulled ink and brush from under the table. You need only write your name there, and the Tao will be fulfilled. You will have traversed the final gate. Zheng Zhang, she will know if I write here. Of course, you will see her tonight. Don't forget your wine, your majesty. Liu Bei grabbed the brush and dipped it in the ink. As soon as he was done drawing out his name, there was a ruckus heard in the next room. Suddenly, Guan Yu and Zhang Fei burst in with struggling women in their arms. Soldiers were grappling with more behind them. The noise was such that little could be said until the fight was over and the women were tied up. What is the meaning of this, brothers? What sordid thing have you schemed? Liu Bei said. We ask that question of the Prime Minister, Guan Yu barked. These coarse women were hiding in the next room. Since you clearly did not know, there can be no question that he intended you harm. Master, is this true? Zhuge Liang had his eyes closed and his lips tightly shut. He picked up his fan and wafted himself a single time before saying, Lord Zhang, the woman on your right shoulder, please put her down so that she may address the Emperor. You want to let a woman make your excuses for you? Just confess right now and let's be done with this, Zhang Fei said. If you comply, no excuse will be needed. Liu Bei nodded to Zhang Fei and he placed the woman down. She was dressed in rich silks and wore her hair with fine golden pins of the imperial household. In the dim light, it took a long time for Liu Bei to recognize her, especially as this was his first time seeing her without her homemade armor. Queen Zheng! he said, bowing deeply. The queen returned the gesture. I have longed to meet with you again ever since the war. 
Could it be that you have come to complete the formation of the Eternal Empire? Glancing to Zhuge Liang, Zheng Jiang said, Yes, your majesty. I did not mean for our reunion to be under these circumstances, but it seems your younger brothers have been up to no good. Brothers, what do you have to say for yourselves? Liu Bei said. We were sure that Zhuge Liang was up to something. Don't tell me his scheme was all just some stupid matchmaking, Zhang Fei said. Elder brother, we must apologize. We and our soldiers have acted unforgivably. Even though it is late, please consider what our punishment should be at once, Guan Yu said. Brothers, you meant well, Liu Bei said. Everyone, please sit. You must have some of the Prime Minister's rare wine. Let's begin our reunion again, after we've all had a cup. Zhuge Liang kept his eyes closed and fanned his face continually as everyone sat down. The servants came in to hand out cups, but Zhuge Liang stopped one and whispered into his ear. Seeing this, Zhang Fei suddenly stood up. He claims he's not up to anything, but look at how he whispers to his servant. He's going to have the wine poisoned, he said. Zhuge Liang chuckled. Lord Zhang, since you noticed, I will tell you. Seeing these heroes assembled here, I couldn't help but feel that the absence of Lord Zhao Yun is worthy of scorn. Therefore, I wanted to surprise you all by secretly summoning him here. But it seems nothing gets past you, Lord Zhang. Delighted with this answer, Liu Bei proposed a toast. Zhuge Liang personally poured the wine to each guest. But while pouring for Zheng Jiang, he said to her, Lady Zheng, after your time in Xiliang, you must be familiar with this sort of wine. Don't let that fool you into drinking too much. Zheng Jiang eyed the cup, her makeup hiding how Zhuge Liang's words had altered her countenance. Queen Zheng, how did you come to be here? Liu Bei asked. I heard that you have become a great man, your majesty. Seeing as my husband is a useless incense seller and my fortunes as a woman have fallen so low, I begged the Prime Minister to let me see you again for all time's sake. Now that I have done so, I care not if I live or die, for I am without regret. My lady, you are truly as free as the wind and as strong as the mountain. I beg you live on for my sake. If that is the Emperor's wish, how can I disobey? If it pleases you, I will happily stay in the palace. That would please me more than anything. It is in line with the Tao, is it not? She said, glancing at Zhuge Liang again. The Prime Minister was still fanning his face, far more rapidly than the cool night justified. This talk might be better suited once we're done with the wine, Guan Yu suggested. Wait a minute, Zhang Fei said. He pointed at Zhuge Liang. The Prime Minister's face is completely pale, but he fans himself like it's the middle of summer. He must be secretly trying to fan his cup to cool it down. Could it be that his poison only takes effect when the brew is warm? Lord Zhang, you embody the tiger in strength and in vigilance, Zhuge Liang said. He stopped fanning and looked down to see that, beside his cup, the ink on the final page of the tome was no longer shining in the candlelight. He placed the fan down and picked up the cup. If you suspect the wine is poisoned, allow me to drink first. Did I not pour all these cups from the same bowl? Let us see if I perish. Without hesitation, he downed the whole cup in one go. Zheng Jiang gasped, drawing a sneer from Zhang Fei. So the bookworm can drink? If you're that easily impressed, this palace will be too much for you, bandit, he said. Brother, how dare you say that? Liu Bei began, but he was cut off by Zhuge Liang spluttering and choking. He started flailing around, and in doing so, he picked up the book beside him and launched it into the air. It fell beside Liu Bei, but the Emperor paid it no heed and rushed over to Zhuge Liang. However, the choking turned into a laugh, and Zhuge Liang said, My apologies, Prime Minister. It seems I have fooled you all. I could not resist. Please, let us hear your toast and drink this exquisite wine like civilized people. Now everyone else started laughing at Zhuge Liang's utterly convincing act. Zheng Zhang made a point of laughing so heartily that the cup in her hand swung around and had most of its contents spilled all about her. Liu Bei returned to his seat, raised his cup and toasted, To the Eternal Empire! The cheer was replied and all drank. Marvelous! 
Guan Yu commented. Bring out more! Servants appeared with more wine and began bringing in food. Zhuge Liang was still chuckling away, apparently at his own little ruse. Tears were appearing in his eyes, giving a truly merry impression. But strangely, they did not stop flowing as he wiped them away. I always said I would save the Empire. I always said it, he said, looking up at the ceiling. To end corruption, to end corruption, down to the very last evil man. Could we have peace any other way? What great misfortune could the likes of me bring upon this world? <laughs> Heaven's will is truly as complete as the sky and as deep as the ocean. What is he blathering about? Drunk already? Zhang Fei asked. Guan Yu shrugged. Liu Bei picked up the tome from the floor in front of him. Zhang Zhang kept her head down and stared at her cup, breathing shortly and sharply. Brothers, these pages here, this wisdom, this is what will end the cycle of death that nearly destroyed the Empire, Liu Bei explained. He was about to pass it over to Guan Yu, but Zhuge Liang suddenly stood, performed a shaky bow, and collapsed over forwards before he could straighten up again. It's not funny if you just do it again, Zhang Fei said. The servants in the wings seemed concerned, but were unsure whether to enter. When Zhuge Liang did not move at all, no one knew what to say. Now Zhang Zhang began to cry, placing her hand on her stomach. Guan Yu suddenly let out a great roar, writhed and tried to stand, but in doing so just stumbled backwards into the wall. He slammed into the floor, blood leaking from his mouth, and shook for a few moments. Brother! Liu Bei screamed. The servants all rushed in now, just in time to catch Liu Bei as he fell, his shaking hands gripping the book violently. This is your doing! Traitor! Zhang Fei screamed at Zheng Zhang, but his movement faltered as he stood. He coughed out some blood. You should have known it would take more than that to kill a legendary drinker like me! He said with a smile. He set upon Zheng Zhang's neck with his hands. You idiot! You think it was me! You really are as dumb as a tiger! She said, smashing her forehead into Zheng Fei's face. Dazed, he toppled over backwards, but rolled out and was up on his feet again with a roar. Zheng Zhang dashed to Zhuge Liang's seat, where a gilded short sword lay beneath the pillow. Zheng Fei snatched a spear from one of the soldiers flooding in, and charged Zheng Zhang with a battle cry heard across the city. In her formal dress, Zheng Zhang could not dodge away. The spear ran her through, but as if nothing had happened, she sliced the shaft in two and leapt upon Zheng Fei, biting and soaring back and forth with her sword edge. Roaring and spluttering, Zhang Fei was felled. Blood poured from Zheng Zhang's front and back. Letting out a cry, she grabbed the bowl of Xiliang wine and clutched it to her chest in her last moments of consciousness. The servants and soldiers were begging the deceased to wake up and wailing out in panic. Just as things began to quieten down, Zhao Yun stormed into the hall with a sword in each hand. Viewing the scene, he fell to his knees. My lord, my lord, I'm so sorry we were too late, a servant said, prostrating himself on the ground. What happened? Zhao Yun asked. It must have been poison. Who could have done this? The servant said. Zhao Yun looked over and saw Zheng Zhang lying beside Zhang Fei with the wine bowl in her hands. He strode over and snatched it up. Inside were purple drops, indistinguishable from the blood covering the floor in the poor light but the taste was certain, Xiliang wine, precisely the sort of wine that the bandit queen herself had boasted of drinking at feasts past. Accursed rogue! You have destroyed the balance of heaven and earth with your facile crimes! My lord, wait! Lady Zhang was the master's esteemed guest. She drank the wine also. Could she really have poisoned it? A servant asked. Zhao Yun listened to the servant's report on earlier events, then spat on Zheng Zhang's body. So that's how it was. She had Zhuge Liang arrange her a private meeting with the Emperor, knowing he could not refuse. But Lord Guan and Zhang showed up unexpectedly, and since she couldn't get our Lord alone, she was forced to drink her own poison just to get our Lord to drink it also. Of course someone so callous as to do this to the realm wouldn't care for their own sacred life either. 
There is no act we can perform on this useless corpse that will sufficiently show our contempt. The thought of funerals turned Zhao Yun's attention back to Liu Bei. He knelt beside his lord and wept freely. Seeing this, all present wept also, and as word carried out of the palace, down the streets, across the bridges, between the post stations, through gates and valleys, and across deserts and seas, all who heard it wept their share. When Zhao Yun finally tried to move the body onto a stretcher, he saw the book clutched in the emperor's hands. He slid it out and opened the cover. He saw Liu Bei's name, written in large characters, upside down. He signed this book. What could it be? He said. Turning it over to read the first page, he gasped. The expression of heaven's mandate, the will of earthly life. It's the emperor's will. His last words. Did he predict this? Indeed, only the son of heaven can know when one's allotted time is over. Quickly standing, Zhao Yun held up the tome and said, I swear that I, Zhao Yun of Changshan, will uphold the final commands of Emperor Dongfeng, my closest friend, and that I will stake my life against any who dare get in my way. Zhao Yun would uphold his oath until the day he died. He was remembered in later times by the lines, With spear singing of the Tao, with sword howling for eternity, the white dragon rider emptied the old and dusty halls. No longer did they plead without their unfilial blood. Four emperors were selected and removed in twenty years. Their names were Liu Tsong, son of the late Liu Biao, Sun Quan, brother of Zhao Yun's first victim, Liu Qing, a lowly man claiming Liu heritage who became unusually popular, and Cao Ang, son of the legendary Southlands official Cao Cao. Then, Empress Zhuge Zhuanli, daughter of Zhuge Liang, secured the throne for her lifetime. By that period, the station of emperor was not so important as all those thousands of stations below, who handled their own affairs and lamented their own tumult as villains and heroes stirred their ranks. Some vestige of the civil war lived on in the chaos of political life under Zhuge Liang's competitive system. Yet when threats beyond the empire emerged, they were able to unify and work as one. In this way, it is said that the cycle that had shattered the empire time and time again had truly been broken. Indeed, the empire was at once shattered and unified, at once eternally at peace and eternally battling. Like a cartwheel mired in the mud, the rise and fall of dynasties was halted. Liu Bei, for his founding role in this, was given the highest possible honours. He was the man who gave the mandate of heaven to the empire itself, and thus proved to the world the right of the Chinese to rule the mountains, plains and oceans in all directions, a right they enforced without hesitation. That which was written of Liu Bei's life in the centuries after his death dwarfs the detail and heroism portrayed in this volume. Strangely though, little is said of the respected diplomat Zhuge Liang. In a mess of conflicting stories, created in attempts to unseat Zhuge Zhuanli, the true nature of Zhuge Liang's contribution was lost to history. Indeed, the entire reason for the reformation of the empire was forgotten with time. So it came to be that when people stated the adage that the empire is eternal, they never stopped to think why that was. Such was the bridge to the upheaval that would later dwarf the events of Liu Bei's wars. While so much knowledge was lost in that era, the tale of the heroes who ended the villainy of pretenders, warlords and kings was not permitted to be forgotten. Thus, the empire, forever divided, forever united, survived, dormant in dreams, awaiting the return of the eastern wind. Thanks for watching all the way to the end of Honor Among Kings. I didn't really know what I was doing the whole time writing this, but I wanted to write something that evoked similar vibes to the book the game is based on, and hopefully that worked out. And hopefully you liked my invented ending to replace the pretty much nothing that happened in the final few hours of the campaign. If you made it this far and haven't done so already, check out my channel for similar things tucked away here and there. 
Massive thanks as always to all patrons who supported the channel throughout the creation of this series. The script is about the length of a short novel, and if I have the time at some point I'll edit it together into an ebook format. Replacing this will be another abridged commentary series instead of another narrative series, in an attempt to generate some more views and algorithm goodness, although haven't decided what yet, possibly Medieval 2 with the Lord of the Rings mod, since that's a cool one and people tend to like that sort of thing. Anyway, that's all for this series, thank you so much for watching, and have a good one.